Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth episode of World Economics, the blog that we started a few months ago uh, to talk about many different things. And uh, the key question these days is trade wars, trade wars. What, why are we seeing uh, all over the headlines everywhere this uh, concept of uh, trade war? What does it mean? Why does it happen? But I want to add another one. It's not just trade wars, it's also currency wars. And we need to understand what is, what is going on. Hmm? Let's start from uh, the, the, the trade part. We have been hearing that protectionism has been rising in the last uh, year, year and a half. That is not correct. The rise of protectionism started a lot earlier than that. Uh, we have seen a gradual but steady increase in protectionist measures since 2001, but particularly since 2008. Governments, the United States between 2008 and 2016, for example, was the country that increased the most the number of protectionist measures. Uh, the European Union, India, Russia, China, all of them have been increasing protectionist measures with, with, with trying to do what? All governments believe that they are suffering in, in parts of their economy uh, due to the unfair uh, advantage of some of the other competitors. Because all of us understand that free trade, that growing trade, is a benefit. It benefits the, the overall economy, it makes economies be more competitive, it makes economies grow further. Think about any of, of the economies in the world. If it only uh, was addressing internal demand, the, uh, the, the, the quality the, uh, and the extent of the industry would be a lot worse. So, you know, global trade allows us to be more innovative, more competitive, higher quality, better services, all of this we all understand. However, some governments and many governments actually believe that they need to protect, that they need to protect what? Usually obsolescent uh, industries, industries that they tend to call strategic or in many cases uh, protected industry. If you think about it, for example, the European Union has a massive budget of subsidies for agriculture. You can consider that protectionism. Protectionism, why? Because uh, it is an unfair advantage for high costs goods and services relative to other countries that could be providing those, sames, uh, those same goods at a much more reasonable price and by and allowing their uh, agricultural uh, uh, their agriculture to improve and their uh, countries to get uh, to get better same with uh, the automotive industry things like that now we need to think that in many cases governments see uh, industries or segments of the economy that are weakening as an unfair disadvantage that comes from uh, excess competitiveness of other countries. That is not really so. Most of it comes from excess capacity built for a completely exaggerated view of what real demand is going to be. So most of these sectors are not suffering because we are seeing an unfair uh, advantage from other countries by providing those services or those goods, but because the demand for those goods and services is actually weakening either because of technology or because of other, uh, of other factors, differences in, in the way in which we consume, the uh, differences in the way in which we manufacture. Um, so when governments try to protect some industries, most of the time what they try to do is subsidize overcapacity. Protectionism usually aims at subsidizing overcapacity. And that increase in protectionism that we have seen in the last uh, uh, decade or so has come precisely on those industries in which the level of overcapacity has proven to be structural. So uh, the idea that governments say is that we're going to protect jobs. In fact, they're not protecting jobs. What they're doing is subsidizing the existing jobs and perpetuating the pain in many cases. Now, we have obviously uh, 
differentiated factor in the case of China. In the case of China, governments all over the world have been allowing China to get away with three important and differentiated factors. One is capital controls, something that most other economies do not have. The second one is lack of respect to, uh, of intellectual property, which is a very, very relevant factor in terms of GDP growth and in terms of added value for many economies, particularly the United States. And third, the level of protectionism created by legal uh, insecurity. No? So when we look at those three factors, uh, the idea was we are going to allow China to remain with some of those uh, imbalances and some of those things that we don't like because they grow a lot and therefore as time passes they will come to the best practices that the rest of the world is used to. Now what has happened particularly in, in, you know, since the financial crisis, is that instead of improving, many of those things have actually worsened. And many of the factors that we understand are uh, bad about protectionism are being perpetuated simply by the fact that the economy is growing a lot. And what ends up happening is that China is exporting this inflation and exporting its excess capacity and its subsidized uh, imbalances into the rest of the world. On one side, you can think, well, protectionism is not going to solve that. But if it's used as a, uh, if you use tariffs as a way of accelerating the uh, change in behavior from your main trading partner, then it might work. It might work from a perspective of a threat because uh, at some point there has to be something else done than just going to the WTO, the World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization has proven to be not very effective in terms of addressing the uh, questions and the concerns of many of the, of the trading uh, countries. So uh, these tariffs that are being used are, they are used as a threat but we have to be extremely careful. Extremely careful, why? Because those threats that might work can also be used as a justification to keep the existing protectionism, even to increase it. Remember that China, for example, has increased capital controls once tariffs were implemented. So it has actually retreated from its position of opening the economy. It has gone to close a little bit more, a little bit, its economy. Um, so that is one factor the trade war that is not, it doesn't benefit anybody. There is nothing good about a trade war. Trade wars are always negative from the perspective of consumers. They're always negative from the perspective of growth. And they're definitely negative from the perspective of competitiveness, productivity, salaries, and wages. But there is a second factor, currency wars. Currency wars exist, and, the re and, and the, uh, let's say the proof that they exist is that every single central banker, when is asked about whether they are trying to uh, devalue the currency, they always say, no, we are not targeting the yen, the euro, or the dollar. But they are. And the fact is that uh, central bankers, by injecting massive liquidity and lowering interest rates, are generating uh, a war to try to make a currency more, quote unquote, competitive, which is ridiculous. Because at the, at the heart of this problem, trade wars, currency wars, is the idea that competitiveness comes from monopolistic uh, approaches from the side of governments or central banks. Com uh, competitiveness comes from added value, not from uh, mm, hidden subsidies, which is what depreciation of the currency and protectionism are. Uh, they're hidden subsidies that end up being against the consumer, against the saver, against salaries, against wages, against uh, productivity and competitiveness. Um, what is the problem of currency wars as well? Is that everybody says that they're not uh, doing anything to de depreciate the currency, but they continue to massively increase money supply and to uh, play around, manipulate interest rates. So if you do those two things, you are creating a sense of security on the sectors that should be thriving and improving and preparing themselves for change. 
In reality, what you're doing is perpetuate the imbalances of the economy and perpetuate the problems that have created this sense of unfair competitiveness in the first place. Um, it is very difficult that one country goes out and says, you know what, we're not going to do any of that and we're going to benefit from the mistakes of everybody else. Why? Because the, 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 the logical idea that no, uh, pr uh, no measure against uh, protectionist countries and no uh, measure from the central bank uh, is going to end up benefiting you doesn't add one part of the equation, doesn't add the part of the equation that if there's one country or two of those countries whose objective is not growth or to uh, hide their imbalances, but control. Hmm? And this is the problem, particularly of the current trade war, is that if one of the countries has the idea of perpetuating overcapacity, massively increasing imbalances, and making its economy artificially competitive, the idea is not to grow further or to increase market share. The idea is to, is to create a monopoly and end up making monopolistic decisions. So part of the threat is important, but it's very important as well to play with that very thin balance, very, very thin balance of the risk of using the threat of tariffs to improve trade rather than become uh, than it becoming a justification for more protectionism. When we look at the challenges of the global economy today, we all understand that more free trade, less uh, intervention in, in the financial markets, and less intervention in, in currencies and in, in global money supply would definitely avoid a lot of the problems that are being built for the future. But we also need to understand that we cannot adhere to the same principles if everybody is doing a set of, is, is playing by a set of rules and one country is playing by another. Therefore, the, this country needs to come back to the main uh, principles that we all adhere to. Free capital movements, improvement of uh, uh, intellectual property and legal security. Those three factors will help everybody and, and the country itself. And if China does that, then things will get better for China and for, rest, um, for the rest of the world. But if this trade and currency war continues as a justification for each other to repeat and repeat all over again the same uh, hidden subsidies that are built in the current imbalances of the economy, the only thing that we're going to enter into is a crisis. Thank you very much. Thank <music> you.